we are grateful today because we serve an awesome and a mighty God. Yeah, what a marvelous and wonderful God we serve. We are grateful. Uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Uh, but when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. Thank you, Lord, for ripening the atmosphere. Thank you, Lord, for the movement of the Spirit. Thank you, God, for your power and your presence. And will you demonstrate in this house, show out in such a way that when we walk out of the door, we will know without any doubt that we have been in your presence. Thank you, God in advance for what has already been accomplished. We praise you. We glorify your name. We thank you for every blessing that will come forth. Speak now, O oh God, in Jesus' name. And God's people said together, Amen. Amen. Oh. Uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Uh, I want to do the part two today to part one. Part one last week was preparing for the coming of the Holy Spirit, what we got to do to get ready. Uh, today we want to talk about it's here. <laughs> It's made his way. Uh, let me talk to you from this thought. Pentecost power. Pentecost power. Uh, hashtag God's power. God's power. Uh, uh, last week, we had a conversation with you uh, regarding Pentecost and its definition. We said that Pentecost comes from the Greek word, you remember, Pentecoste, which means 50. So Pentecost was a celebration on the 50th day after Passover, and it was a culmination of what is called the Feast of Weeks. Pentecost in the New Testament is the arrival of the Holy Spirit for the church of the living God. At Pentecost, the disciples of Jesus were gathered and upon the filling of the Holy Spirit, they, they heard a great wind and spoke in tongues as tongues of fire that settled upon each of them. Now, the significance of the fire can be found in recognizing it as a symbol of the indwelling of God, the Spirit of God. Now, Pentecost family was a divinely planned event. It was not Pentecost, was, was no mere afterthought with God. God just didn't think of Pentecost in the moment. It was the divine plan of God. That's how God works. The coming of the Holy Spirit was, was as much a part of the redemption plan of God as was, listen to this, the incarnation, the death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit did not make its first appearance at 
Pentecost. It is mentioned, it is my beloved, mentioned as the cre as as the creation account in Genesis chapter one and verse number two. Hear these words. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It is also shown to be doing the Father's work throughout the Old Testament and the Gospels. However, my beloved, the Spirit arrived in the upper room with a fresh mission from God. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit it empowered people for a specific task. And when God wanted a job done, God chose someone to do it, and then the Holy Spirit equipped them, gave them the necessary gifts and graces to get the job done. Listen, God gave power. God gave power only to those people and didn't necessarily remain with them for long. Listen, the Holy Spirit, the pouring out on all people was first prophesied. It's in the Bible in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, which Peter quoted. He did. He quotes it in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 21, when he proclaimed the prophecy had been fulfilled by the events witnessed by the Jerusalem crowd that dramatic Sunday. Now, the context around this prophecy, you got to hear this, yeah, the context around this prophecy in the book of Joel was a locust plague. It was a, it was a locust plague. It was a locust plague that devastated Israel. Every type of crop had been ravaged. The cattle were left without pasture. That just simply means there wasn't nothing for the cows to eat. And, and the tragedy was compounded by a drought. What no water, nowhere. Yet, yet, Joel had hope based on what the Lord had said. I wish I can park here for a minute and tell somebody that no matter what you're going through in life, if the Lord's word declares that you can make it through, don't worry about your circumstances. You've got to trust in God. Uh, listen, listen to what he says, even in the midst of devastation. Listen to what he says. Here he is. He said, even now, even now, even now, I need some even now people in here. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Well, after promising agricultural healing, agricultural healing in the text, Joel then proclaims that the spirit will be poured out on all people, all people, all people, all people, everybody, regardless of gender, age, or social status. He, he links the concept of agricultural and economic abundance, watch this, to spiritual restoration. The verb pour out, pour out in Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and in Hebrews 3 and 1, it alludes to the healing rains God would send upon the land. How many of you know that God is a healing God? He is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the prophet saw a theological link between the material blessings of God in a rich harvest and the spiritual benefits obtained when God gives his word and when God gives his spirit. Look, the sacred assembly to which Joel called the people in Joel 2 and 15 to mourn and repent. Mourn and repent. Uh, somebody needs to hear me. Mourn and repent is also an important to the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. Instead of a Thanksgiving harvest festival in that year, the Israelites held a special day of mourning and repentance because 
because their crops had been devastated. Just as Leviticus 23 and 21 commanded that all Israel should gather together and there should be no regular business conducted on Pentecost, Joel demanded that all the people gather before God in a sacred assembly. It is fitting here then that the gift of the spirit in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy should have come on the harvest celebration, or rather celebrating the day of Pentecost. The connection, got to hear me, got to hear me. The connection between the Passover to Pentecost is also worth noticing here. Listen, the slaughter of the Passover lamb recalled the great deliverance of Israel's exodus from Egypt and it marked, it marked the beginning of the harvest with the offering of the first fruit. Man, how many of you know that God is a deliverer? The Feast of Weeks, here it is, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost in parentheses, was the Thanksgiving celebration for the grain harvest. Jesus' crucifixion at Passover similarly was the sacrifice for the deliverance of his people and the subsequent pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was the fulfillment of what his sacrifice had promised. Therefore, Acts chapter 2, we're in the book now, must be interpreted as a special historical event signifying a new period in God's dealing with God's people. Listen, Pentecost signals the dawning of the age of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And the fullness of the Spirit in God's people is to empower them for witness to all nations. Thus, the meaning of Pentecost is God's equipping his church with the power of his Spirit so that God will be glorified among the nations. Listen, the point of Pentecost is mission. Somebody ought to write that down. It's mission. And the goal of mission is, watch this, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. If we properly understand this great, uh, uh, this great historic event, our hearts will be inflamed with the cause of seeing people from every tribe and tongue and, and nation bowing before the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. Now to understand this, and I'm getting to the point here of this event, we must understand the Jewish feast of Pentecost. There were three great feasts each year. Number one, you had the Passover, and the Passover was in the spring, and they celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt, followed immediately by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Pentecost, also called the Feast of Weeks, which occurred 50 days, seven weeks after Passover. And then we had tabernacles in the fall. Now, Pentecost was a harvest feast where the Jews were to offer to the Lord the first fruits of the new grain. Now, among other rituals, they were to weigh before the Lord two loaves of wheat bread made with leaven. Now, the picture came to fulfillment in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Until this time, the Lord's people consisted of Israel along with a few Gentile proselytes. Not all in Israel were believers, but it was through the nation exclusively that God worked through his covenant promises to form a people for himself. But now the Lord formed the body of Christ, the church made up of Jews and Gentiles on equal footing. You will recall that the Lord told Peter he did that he would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
Hence the church founded on the apostolic confession and witness of Christ is God's means of taking the gospel to the nations resulting in his being glorified in all the earth. We need to remember that our purpose as the Lord's church, our purpose, here it is, is not to focus on ourselves and our own happiness. Our purpose is to spread the knowledge of God to all the nations beginning here in our own Jerusalem. If we lose our outward focus, I'm going to help somebody with the overall purpose of God's glory, we have lost our reason for existence. Now, as I looked at this portion of Acts, I wondered, I did at first, why Luke goes through this long, somewhat tedious list of nations in the Bible. He starts east of Israel and he ends up surrounding the land. While most of the men mentioned were Jews, a few were Gentile proselytes. They are representatives of the nations that the Lord wants to reach. Now, the key to, to the list in verse 5, uh, yeah, that is, it represents men of every nation under heaven. There were, there were devout men, meaning God-fearing. you got to be God-fearing. But they did not yet know their Messiah had come and had been sacrificed. Peter will shortly explain all of that in his upcoming sermon. Now, this list of nations, it reminds us, it does, of the list of nations in Genesis chapter 10, which led to the building of the Tower of Babel. Do you remember that? Yeah, God judged those proud men by confusing their languages and here by his grace look at somebody say by his grace here by his grace God turned this confusion of tongues into a miracle of miraculous speech resulting in great blessings isn't it amazing how God can take something broken and turn it around for his glory the gift of speaking in tongues was a special miracle to demonstrate God's purpose in taking the gospel to all nations. It enabled the church to be launched in all these places when these men return to their homes. But the point is this. God's plan is no longer to be confined to the Jews. His good news is for everybody. Aren't you glad uh, that God's word is not for a select group of people, but that God's word is for everybody? As John proclaims in Revelations 5 and 9, he purchased for God uh, with his blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nations. We cannot rest until all the nations have heard the good news about Christ. But how can we possibly fulfill God's plan? Well, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not just a divine force. It is the third person of the church. Trinity. Jesus calls him the paraclete or comforter. Middle English paraclete borrowed from the late Latin paracletus. It means advocate comforter. It's borrowed from the Greek parakletos, meaning advocate, helper, or comforter. A description of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John 14 and 26. A derivative of parakletos, adjective, meaning call to one side. I said all that to tell you that no matter what you're going through, God is always on your side. Huh. Look at somebody say, I know that's right. No matter how hard life is, no matter how much trouble you face, no matter how fierce the devil is, God is always on your side. Well, before the day of Pentecost, here it is, the Holy Spirit regenerated humanity and empowered them to serve God. Regenerated and empowered. Somebody ought to remember that. Regenerated and empowered. You can't be uh, empowered unless you've been changed. You miss what I said. The power of God don't work in nobody's life unless you've been changed. 
You got to be changed first and then you're empowered. He changed your life and then he empowers you for his service. But he did not permanently indwell in all believers. But in the upper room, Jesus told the disciples that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. Thus, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples, watch this, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's in Acts chapter 1 verse 5. In fulfillment of Jesus' promises in Acts chapter 8, the Spirit was poured out on the Samaritans through the apostles so that both they and the apostles would realize that they were now members of the same body of Christ. The same thing happened with the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 and with the followers of John's baptism in Ephesus. That's in Acts chapter 19. These tra uh, transactional uh, or transactional transitional rather outpouring of the Holy Spirit they followed a pattern in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 now once the transition was completed all that believe in Christ watch this receive the Holy Ghost at the moment of their salvation that's in Galatians chapter 3 verses 2 through 5 we are however commanded watch this to be filled with the spirit which means to be controlled by the spirit of God Ephesians 5 and 18 the disciples on the day of Pentecost were not only baptized with the spirit church they were also filled with the Holy Spirit you missed what I said I said they were baptized with the spirit but they were also filled with with the spirit now the initial outpouring of the spirit at Pentecost was marked by three symbolic occurrences I'm gonna give them to you real quick and we gonna get up out of here the first occurrence was the sound look at somebody say sound it was the sound of a violent rushing wind I said the sound of a violent rushing wind was primarily a picture of invisible power as you know, the wind, which you cannot see, exerts incredible power in a tornado or hurricane. In this case, the disciples heard the noise, but there is no indication that they felt it blowing. You missed what I said. They heard it, but they didn't feel it. It was rather a miraculous sound that came from heaven. The noise was loud enough that it gathered the crowd to find out what was happening. Can I tell you this? Whenever God shows up, people will always gather to see the manifestation of God. But listen, the Hebrew and Greek words for wind and spirit are the same. In Ezekiel 37, God commanded the prophet to prophesy to the winds to breathe, here it is, on the valley of dry bones. When he did so, the breath of life, the breath of life came into them. God explains that he will put his spirit within his people and they would come to life. In John chapter 3, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the need to be born of the spirit. He explained, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the wind. Ah, it is a mighty power, but we cannot see it. We can only see the effects of the Holy Spirit. You couldn't see the Holy Spirit come into your house and wreck your situation, but you saw the after effects. You didn't see the Spirit come in and work with your financial situation, but you saw the after effects. And there's some people in here who understand that you got to learn how to praise God before, yeah, but then you better learn how to open up your mouth and give God praise after God performs a miraculous healing, a miracle in your life. I wish I could park here for a second and tell about 10 people, you better open up your mouth and give God praise. I didn't come to church to sit like a bump 
upon a log. I came to give God some glory because the Lord has been good. Look at somebody tell him, he's been good to me. He's been good. Well, the Holy Spirit, like the wind, is a mighty power. But we can't see it. We can only see the effects. One of his most powerful effects is when he imparts spiritual life to those who are dead in their sins. Man, that's just a better way of saying, I'm so glad he saved my life. Anybody else glad you got saved? <laughs> you were on your way to the pit of hell, and he saved you. You were on your way to complete damnation, but he saved your soul. You were on your way to burn in an eternal fire, but he changed your life. And because he changed your life, you got about five praises in you right now, ready to open up your mouth and say, thank you, God. I wonder if anybody understands how bad we were off. We were on our way, but then he died for our sins. That's why I got to give him praise and I got to give him glory. Well, well, let me keep moving. I got to keep moving. The second occurrence was the appearance of, of tongues of fire resting on everybody in the room. Did you hear what I said? I said tongues of fire rested on everybody in the room. Look at your neighbor and say, do you got fire? <laughs> Look at somebody else say, you got fire? You got fire. <laughs> throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, fire symbolizes God's presence. Now ask him the question again. You got fire? <laughs> he said, Moses in the wilderness saw the bush that was burning and yet it did not consume. God himself was in the bush. <laughs> Later Israel in the wilderness was guided and protected. Here it comes by the pillar of of fire. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist predicted that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with, oh my God, look at somebody say fire with fire. Jesus said that he had come to cast fire upon the earth. Luke 12 and 19, Hebrews 12 and 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. Oh my God, look at somebody say fire. You got fire in you now? Well, fire, fire does two things. Fire brings heat and it brings light. Whew. The heat of fire, it consumes. I'm telling you, the heat of fire, it consumes the waste, the mess, uh, purifying those who come in contact with it or destroying those who have no gold in them. Now, the heat of fire also pictures the zeal that should mark uh, believers who are to be hot. Look at somebody say, I'm hot. I'm hot. Uh, I'm hot for God. Uh, I didn't come in here to play church. I came in here on fire. Look at somebody say, on fire, on fire. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, those who are hot. I ain't lukewarm. Any lukewarm people in here? Any lukewarm? Uh-uh. I'm on fire. Yeah. The light, listen, the light, it pictures the illumination that God brings to those in spiritual darkness. Uh, you not only have fire, but he is the light of the world. Uh, when you were in darkness, guess who showed up? Uh, yep, he turned on the lights uh, and he gave you the ability and the opportunity to see the mess you were in. Uh, he turned on the light. Listen, listen, there's some people you need to remember that he turned on the light in your life uh, and you were able to see the mess uh, that you you were in uh, and the fact that God has a way of cleansing you oh my God look at somebody say fire fire well, well the fire the fire on the day of Pentecost it appeared in the form of tongues to symbolize God's power Woo! ain't no power like God's power look at two or three people tell them ain't no power like God's power ain't no 
Ain't no power like God's power. Ain't no power like God's power. Well, God's power through the proclamation of his word burning into the people in a way that purifies them. Don't you know that God's word purifies you? That's why on Sunday morning, I got to draw in. I got to hear what God is saying because God's word, it will purify my situation. Oh, my God. He later said the gospel is the power of, of, of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's in Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. Now, let me get to the nitty gritty and the grits down through the church history the Holy Spirit has moved unseen as the wind where he wills goes wherever he wants to go whenever he feels like it and you don't control him he controls us y'all miss what I said I wish I could talk about it he wills listen to this to be, or to bring rather, revival. And what I said earlier, I said revival, revival. And invariably, it starts with the church purifying God's people, igniting their cold hearts with a new passion for knowing God and burning off the waste of the world that's contaminated them. Listen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God does what no humanly orchestrated revival could ever do. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to say that one more time. There's what we call humanly orchestrated revivals. You missed what I said. Human orchestrated revival. We're going to have a tent revival and we're going to bring in somebody to preach revival, orchestrate it. Oh, I wish I could talk about that. But listen, God brings lasting change by regenerating and purifying dead people so that, so that God is glorified as people recognize God's mighty work. Here it comes. Such revival is clearly a sovereign act of God, not the result of any human effort or planning. That just means God will show up and do what God wants to do. And you don't have to be in a tent revival to get God's glory. All you've got to do is be where God called you to be and you can have revival. Can I say it like this? You can have revival in your house. If God shows up in your house, you can have a revival. If God shows up on your job, you can have revival. If God shows up in the parking lot, he can have revival with about 10 people, not orchestrated. Y'all just having conversation about God and how good God is and how God blessed you. And all of a sudden, you break out in revival. Look at somebody say, revival. Okay, let me give you this last piece and we out of here. I got to go. We're going to get out of here early. Look at somebody say early. I learned a long time ago, early bird. Uh, you got it. Catches the worm. Here we go. The final occurrence was not to encourage believers to have an ecstatic experience for their own edification. Okay, let me say that again because y'all didn't hear what I said. I said the final occurrence, final occurrence was not to encourage believers to have an ecstatic experience for their own edification or pleasure. Oh, the meaning of Pentecost was that God gave the Holy Spirit to the church so that they would bear witness to the nations of his glory. You miss what I said. Look at somebody say, ain't about you. <laughs> look at two more people say, ain't about you, baby. <laughs> I know you look good and, and, and you got it going on, but can I tell you something? <laughs> it ain't you, it's God. <laughs> oh, I wish I had some people say, go ahead and preach, pastor. <laughs> yeah, these Jews from all these nations, they heard the disciples speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Peter will soon preach the gospel leading to the con conversion, rather, of 3,000 people. 
<laughs> he preached uh, and 3,000 people got saved. Oh my God. But the goal of the gospel is the glory of God. That's it right there. God's glory is the magnificent worth, loveliness, and majesty of his many perfections. Note that uh, not all responded positively, positively, even though this was a miracle. Even miracles will not convince mockers and haters who do not want to submit their lives to God. The book of Acts is a record not only of, of, of conversions, but also fierce opposition to the preaching of the gospel. But we know that our God will be victorious. I mean, I want to stop right there. God's going to be victorious all the time. Okay, I got to say that again because I don't think that landed right. God will always be victorious in your life. I, listen, I don't care what you came in here with. There's victory all in you because Christ is working in your life. Look at somebody say, there's victory. That just simply means uh, that you are an overcomer because of who is inside of you. That just simply means you're not going to fall apart because of who's in you. That means you're not going to lose your mind because of who's working in your situation. That means that the bill's going to get paid, the rent's going to be taken care of, car payment's going to be managed. You know why? Because of who you trust. You trust in God. I came here to prophesy to some people today that your life might be difficult and you might be going through some hard times, but I came to tell you that if you put your trust in the power of God, he'll make it right. I came to tell you that you can't focus on the problem. You've got to focus on God. You can't focus on people who are trying to tear you down. You've got to focus on God. I came to tell about 10 of y'all, you got to focus on God. Here's the word the prophecy says, that you've got to keep your hand in God's hands. You've got to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to thine own understanding to acknowledge him in all thy ways and he'll do what uh -huh. he'll direct your path he'll make everything all right look at somebody say he gonna make it right because God's power is working even right now I came by here to tell somebody his power's all over you when you feel down out broken you can trust that God will lift you up any Anybody lift it up, you feel better. You may have come in here feeling like a weight was on your shoulders, but I'm glad about it. Look at somebody say, I'm glad. I'm glad that I got power. And it's the kind of power that will never lose its power. Oh, that's good. It won't ever stop. Don't you know that your car will run out of gas and you got to go to the gas station and you got to fill it up so that it can keep moving with its power. Don't you know that trains and engines, they got to be fueled so they can keep on moving. They run out of fuel. They got to stop and they got to get more fuel. Don't you know the airplane that you fly, it's got to have fuel to take off and to land. But if you don't put no fuel in it, it ain't going nowhere. And if you don't put enough fuel in it, it'll get off the ground. But you're going to have some problems once you get up in the air. I came to tell you, but with God's power, you don't have to go to the gas station. You don't have to do it. You don't need any steam to run it. You don't need anybody to plant it in your soul. It's already there. Because the Bible says on the day of Pentecost uh, that the Spirit came uh, and it filled God's people. Uh, and when God fills you, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you got to know that you know that you know that you know, baby, that you know uh, that nobody can steal your joy. Uh, yeah, I got some joy people in here. Uh, the devil thought he had you. Uh, but guess what? Uh, 
You are a miracle. You ought to testify and tell somebody I'm still standing. I thought it was over. I thought my life was gone. Thought it was over, but guess what? I'm still here. Wave at me. Let me know you're still here. You thought the divorce was going to kill you. And you went through something. But can I tell you? You got all kinds of guys looking at you. You just don't know it. God bless your life. You got to keep on trucking. Keep on trucking, baby. That's what the prophet said when he sung, keep on trucking. I think that was the temptation, I think. You got to keep on moving. Look at somebody say, you got to keep going. You can't give up. Uh-uh. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've been in. You just don't know how hard it was for me to get up and put on my clothes and come to church. You don't know how the devil's been working. But I tell you what, I'm glad. Aren't you glad that you put on your clothes and you ate your vittles and you got in your hootie and you came to church because God has a word for you. Look at somebody say he got a word. He got a word. And his word is this. He got power. Look at somebody say he got power. Man, let me tell you something. He's got power. When you're weak, he's got power. When you're lonely, he's got power. When you don't have a friend in the world, he's got power. Look at somebody say power, power. He's got power, power, man. I'm telling you, it's going to fix it. It's going to be all right. When you walk out of church, walk out with your head up. I don't care what they said for you got here. You got new strength. You got new power. You just tapped in to a power source that God already gave you. You ought to walk in it. You ought to live in it. You ought to, oh my God. You ought to exist in it. And every single time that the devil comes, you've got to call on his power. Look at God. Say, call on it. Call on it. Say, Lord, I need you. I'm going through. And I need you. I don't have a friend. And I need you. I've got troubles. But I need you. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you call him, he gonna come. To any witnesses in here who can testify that when you call him, he gonna come. To when you open your mouth, he gonna show up. And can I tell you this, if you don't have the strength to call his name, all you got to do is moan. Look at him, look at your neighbor, say, you got to moan sometimes. Sometimes a Oh God, will get you what you want. Sometimes, uh, ooh, oh, mm, Lord, will get you what you want. And when you can't say nothing, all you got to do is get in the spirit and let God do what God's going to do. I dare about ten of y'all to look at somebody and say, ain't no power like God's power. Ain't no power like his power. No authority like his authority. The same God that blessed you yesterday is the same God that's going to bless you today. I dare about 20 yards. Open up your heart and say power, power, wonderful working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Power to keep you going. Power. I gotta sit down. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Power when you're weak. Power when you're by yourself. Power. Power. Come on, give me some praise. Give him some glory. Open your mouth and say, thank you, God. Wave your hands. Say, I know he'll make a way out of no way. He's still on your case. He's still fixing. He's still moving. He's still blessing. Open your mouth and say, yeah.
Can somebody say God's power? God's power.